time to be involved to be involved and working in R, there's been a lot of really nice changes that have made uh, particularly data analysis um, much easier. So if you feel comfortable, do say hello. I know a few people have said hello in the chat, but um, tell me a little bit about yourself in the chat as well, where you're from uh, would be lovely. Um, so the motivation for this, uh, this um, and Emily can take some credit for, for this, um, I think, because we were trying to think about good topics um, or possible topics. And uh, just recently, a paper by Jessica Horman and Andrew Gelman appeared in the journal, the Harvard Data Science Review Journal, um, which is a philosophical piece in a sense, uh, but it's titled Designing for Interactive um, exploratory data analysis requires theories of graphical inference. And that was a discussion paper. So there's a half a dozen people that were invited to um, write commentary on that paper. Actually, if you if you actually go to my slides, slides you can click on um, links. And so there is a link for that paper if you're interested in that paper. Um, and so in I think it's an interesting paper for um, now um, and has some good points to make a relative to data science generally, and particularly in terms of graphics research. Um, it talks about the interplay between exploratory data analysis and confirmatory data analysis. And these are two areas where we have thought that it's a really big gap between them. Um, they argue it's not a big gap. Well, it's not a big gap in good and bad ways at times. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes there's a bad overlap, which means it compromises confirmatory data analysis. Um, and uh, if, but if you only do confirmatory analysis, analysis you miss, um, you potentially miss a lot of very interesting information. Um, another main point of it is that a lot of the tools that we have for doing exploratory data analysis today, like, um, oh gosh, now Tableau, I think, is um, one of the main ones that people use. They don't have good tools for testing your findings. So a lot of good graphics, but not, not the tools that help you dis determine whether what you're seeing in the plots um, are reliable or not. Um, but there's also a lot of different terms um, being floated around in terms of confirmatory and exploratory data analysis. And that's the first thing I want to talk about. Um, EDA, IDA, MD, InfoViz are things um, that are all interwoven. So EDA, exploratory data analysis, IDA, initial data analysis, MD, model diagnostics, and InfoViz. So where do those all fit into the data analysis pipeline is what we focused on, or one of the things we focused on in our commentary. So I have a few little diagrams here. Um, that describe some of the differences between them. Um, I've tended to think of confirmatory data analysis and exploratory data analysis as distinct, um, but they don't, they bleed, bleed together in different ways. But the, um, the difference I think comes at the start of an analysis. Um, you'll often hear in a statistics course or even a data science course that you have to come up with a question first. Well, that's different. Um, in exploratory data analysis, often we start with the data. Often you're given a data set and you say, go explore. So that, that's one of the primary differences, um, that starting point into a data analysis. So confirmatory, you're typically starting with a question or a hypothesis, and then you collect the data or, um, or the data has been provided, but, but the data comes after you've made that um, question. And then um, you should do some initial data analysis as a first step, initial data analysis would be checking any assumptions that you have to make because with confirmatory data analysis, you typically have a lot more constraints and restrictions. And if your data doesn't conform to that, then that compromises the statements that you can make at the end. So initial data analysis is that um, assumption checking, like if you're using linear discriminant analysis, for example, you make an assumption that the, the groups come from a multivariate normal distribution. If those groups don't, it, yeah, if your samples don't come from 
multivariate normal, then um, linear discriminant analysis is not the right model for you. Um, if you're doing hypothesis testing of means, if you've got outliers in your data, that's going to affect your mean um, estimation. And, and so uh, that will compromise your hypothesis test. So that's the type of thing that would go on in an initial data analysis. It's kind of um, as a prep for the date for the answering the question or setting your model or doing the test. Um, after you do your modeling, and uh, maybe even after you're doing your testing, doing some diagnostics, like make residual plots to assess how well the model is actually fitting your data um, is a common thing to do. And that's what we would call model diagnostics. Um, and then um, after you've made some uh, conclusions, maybe you want to present it visually. And that's a place where um, maybe I would, put this as uh, information visualization. Some people in information visualization might argue with me there, but I, I feel like it's that's a communication um, part of um, the work and that's where uh, communication graphics can be useful. All right, so in contrast to that, um, if we're doing an exploratory data analysis, as I say, we would typically start with the data, but we might not always start with the data. We might start with a really vague or general question. So it doesn't have a, specific answer in mind. It might be, what can we learn about um, housing in San Francisco or housing price in San Francisco, San Francisco, for example? So it's not a question that you can answer with a yes or no or a simple, um, a simple um, statement. So we could actually start with a vague or general question. Um, we also might start off with doing a confirmatory data analysis. And when we get the data, we see that there's a lot more variables in that data than we had in, that we, than we would use to answer the question. And so we might take a deviation from confirmatory data analysis and go sideways and do an EDA on the other day on other variables in the data. Um, re regardless of how it starts of either any of those pieces, um, the next step is to do an abstraction. So what are the variables that I have in the data? Um, how was the data collected? Because those components um, basically um, set, help you determine what types of plots you can make, what types of question, what type of calculations you can make, and what sort of inference you might be able to make after doing EDA as well. So abstract out what's in the data, um, and then brainstorm questions. So what what things might we be able to answer given these variables? and given your knowledge of the world. Um, and then it's also good to think about, well, what might we expect to see in terms of the answers to those questions? Because we don't have, we don't have a rigid protocol. So it's good upfront in a, in, a, in a way is to sort of pre-register what you think might be the results. And that can help you assess whether um, the results are um, surprising or, or uh, sensible. And then we do a lot of plots and calculations. And then go back and compare, is it like what we expected or is it different from what we expected? And then we still might do some info this to communicate the results. All right, so I'm going to focus on this part today. And I'm going to um, use the data in the Yowie package. So if you have your laptop um, and you haven't installed it yet, you can install from GitHub. We haven't um, submitted to CRAN yet, but that should be soon. Um, <clears throat> the name, the name comes from um, sort of a legend in Australia. If you look up Yowie, you'll see that a Yowie is something akin to uh, Bigfoot or a Sasquatch um, by Australian standards, and it stands for here as an acronym: Years of Wages to Investigate and Explore. So um, the next step, if you want to follow along with me. Um, and do some of the analysis, grab a copy of the wages.r file. Um, and uh, that's in the same place as the slides um, and load that into your R Studio window. I'll give you a couple of, um, so I just, while, while you're doing that, just a little bit more history to the longitudinal data, um, to the wages data. 
if you've picked up a book on longitudinal data analysis or read a, read a paper on longitudinal data analysis, and even a paper on um, mixed models um, or mixed effects models, you're likely to have seen some version of this data. It's been around for a long time um, and it's continuously being collected. So it was started in 1979 and they've been tracking a, a, a sample of people in the USA for all, all this time. Um, so I first met this data in the, in the 2000s, um, and it was quite interesting. And for a long time, um, I've been trying to reconstruct that data so I can refresh it with more recent data, uh, because since, uh, you know, the data has been collected almost every year um, since 1979, and, and the wages data in the textbook um, uh, all of those textbook data sets sort of end around about um, 2005. Um, so I've been trying to reconstruct or refresh the data for a long time. It's not easy to do. That's a different story altogether. Um, the database is messy, um, but, but also that gives you some context to the history of this data. Um, 1979, the world was a different place. Um, and there are some things that are not really, I would say, um, politically correct in this data collection, but it's, it's good to know about um, those anyway. Alrighty, so I'm going to hop out of my slides and um, go to my R Studio window. Whoops, sorry. Yeah, great. Thanks for sending the link to the um, wages data, uh, wages.r file. Uh, can you see my R Studio window okay? Yes. All righty. That's, I think, one of the nice benefits of Zoom meetings. Um, the code, uh, the uh, font doesn't need to be as large as you have to have in a, um, in a, on a screen in a physical room, um, which is great. You can sort of squash a lot more into the screen. Di, maybe Alrighty. just um, expand it to full screen, your R Studio. Expand the full R Studio. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All righty. So um, if you have the, the file in your R Studio, um, there's a little bit of, there's a lot of commentary in the code, um, actually to help me remind me what I want to do at each step. Um, I'm very nervous about live coding. This is not live coding because I've got all the code worked out, but it's um, running it live. So I'm just going to load the, the Yowie um, library and then um, load. We can actually do a help of that package. Might be good to do. Oh, actually, I've got that line here. And uh, one thing that you see about that package is it's just a data package and there's three data sets. Um, wages HS is um, high schoolers, that's all the, all the data. And then wages HS DO are dropouts, so high school dropouts. So um, the wages HS is everybody, um, but the DO at the end of this last one means that they dropped out of high school. They might've come back and got their high school um, equivalency, uh, graduate uh, equivalency, I think it's called. Um, and then there's a demographic um, data set, just a shorter data set, just um, demographics for each people, person, but that's also um, recorded in each of the wages data as well. I'm gonna start with the dropout um, data because that's the data that I worked with ages ago. Um, and that's quite interesting, I think. Um, just in itself. So first thing is take a look at the data. Um, and I like to use glimpse um, to look at to look at the uh, da data generally, to look at tibbles, or in this case, um, it's actually a Sybil. Um, I think that's hopefully that's set up right, but um, it's a, there's a new type of data structure for time series data called a TSIBBLE. And that's how the data is delivered um, in here. And it just provides 
some automatic uh, time handling. And also if you've got um, uh, groups in your data, like in this case, we're measuring people over time, um, that there's a variable here that's um, the ID variable is considered a key. And, and that allows us to do operations on um, those groups separately. Um, year is a time variable and um, the civil object recognizes that time variable as well. So it allows us to do some shortcuts. Um, Sybil was put together by um, a young woman, Iro Wang, who gave a talk in New York City a few years ago about, about this work. Um, so if you look at the data, there's not that many variables. Uh, there's an ID for each subject as a year. And you should see that the years run, um, uh, we'll look at that in a moment, but it runs from 1979 through to 2018. It's the most recent year. Um, the next uh, variable that's um, interesting for us is mean hourly wage. Sorry, it's a bit long. We might actually shorten that variable name, but some people have multiple jobs in the year um, and at different times in the year. And so the hourly wage might be different. So for each person in that year, we've sometimes um, averaged their hourly wage across different jobs. And that's why it's named um, that. Uh, we have the age when they were first entered into the database in 1979. We have their gender, but gender is only male or female. Um, we also have a race variable. Um, and that's another thing that I don't agree with um, necessarily. It's a, a sort of an artificial construct, really, and, and too much focus on race, um, I, I think, in some analyses. But it is important for understanding um, how, how our demographics affect um, our experience over um, all. Uh, there's also, um, these are the education variables, HGC, highest grade completed. Um, and you'll see that there's a few there that have 12th grade and also highest grade um, completed as an integer. Um, and we also recorded um, what year they achieved that, which allowed us to work out whether the person was a high school dropout or not, if they um, completed 12th grade well and truly after they, they were scheduled to um, complete 12th grade, then um, they, they, they must be a dropout. We also record things like number of jobs, total hours worked. And uh, we also had to do a bit of cleaning of the data. And those, um, those, those indicator variables at the end um, uh, are, are, are just keeping a track of that. Alrighty, so given that data, the first thing is to, um, or given those set of variables, the first thing to think about is what questions might we answer with this data? So from my, my, my choice of questions, um, I think the primary question given a longitudinal data set is how wages of high school dropouts have changed over time. And particularly because we have that information per person, we'd like to know how each individual um, experienced their wages over their workforce um, lifetime. Um, we might also then uh, think about some, so to me, those are the primary questions that this data can answer. And then we might think about some smaller questions. Uh, is there a difference in experience based on some of the demographic variables, education, gender, and race? Um, What's the highest wage that's been, that was typically earned? What's the lowest wage? How many records for each individual? Um, and now, now that you have some questions, so feel free to add some more questions if you have um, any suggestions. Um, feel free to add more questions into the chat. But uh, the next thing is to think about what we might expect to see. So if um, we're tracking wages over time, um, and I do think these are, I think they've been adjusted for inflation um, already. I need to go back and check on that because it's something that we need to make sure we write in the description for the data. But um, what would you expect to see in terms of wage, um, hourly wage, the longer persons in, um, in the workforce? 
um, I think we would tend to want to see or tend to expect to see that there's a gradual increase over time. Um, so that the longer you're in the workforce, you earn more and more um, money. Um, and then in terms of gender, education and race, what would you expect to see? You kind of hope that the more education you have, that your wages are higher. Um, we, um, as most of us are women, we tend to think that probably the wages are lower for women um, overall. And then there are likely race gaps as well. Um, race is not measured very um, well. Anyway, it's, a con it's an artificial construct. Um, so let's start, start by taking a look at the data. Um, and so the first thing to do is, um, again, this is what I think the first thing to do is, is uh, calculate how many observations uh, per, per person. So this key size function is a Sybil package function. And um, that's calculating the number of records per individual. And the summary at the end is just giving a simple summary of that. So we'll see that um, some people have as few as five records and some people have um, 28 records. Uh, so that's a, that's a very complete um, set of data for some people. Um, 28 is the maximum number of years that were recorded in this data. Um, it might be good to also take a look, look at that as a histogram um, because we, we can then see how many observations of each of those. Let's see if this pops up in the right hand side. Yeah, so here's, um, here's a histogram. In a sense, it's a bar chart because this is integer data, but um, it, it's continuous enough to think about it as a histogram um, where the bars go from um, one interval to another. Just a couple of things that were done differently in that display is I set the sequence of breaks to run from 4.5 to 28.5, so that the middle of the bar represents the um, number of records, the integer. And so what do we learn from that? Um, you'll see that, um, I don't know if I can annotate. Yeah, I can't annotate, but you can see that there are um, fewer people with a small number of records. Um, there's a peak at around the um, largest numbers, around about 27. Um, the last one here is 28. Um, so they maybe haven't completely finished collecting the last um, year's data or processing the last years of data, given, um, given that 27 years um, is um, much higher than 28 years. Uh, that could come about also because if the data collection is in the middle of the year, um, people that have been, that started their workforce experience in the second half of their year would only be at 27 years. So I think 28 is just a data collection um, anomaly that um, it's based on the timing of the survey. So we, so the, the really nice thing is that they've got a lot of um, staying power, you might say, with the people that a lot of people have stuck with um, the survey for all of this time, um, but they do have a consistent dropout rate. Um, make sure I get my chat back up. Um, next thing to do is maybe take, take a look at um, just some of the traces for individuals. So I could do that by computing um, a new variable, I'm just going to collect information on each individual, that, that is that how many observations were made, and then um, only uh, look at the people who were recorded for the 28 years, because that's a small number. I can make those plots of those individuals really quite easily. You're managing to follow along with me. 
So we look at the, the um, time series of wages for, maybe I'll pop this up in a separate window, for all of the people that have been in the study for 28 years. And what do we see? What do we see from that? Um, almost all of these individuals have overall an increasing um, pattern. There's one individual, 1515, that jumps out in the second row of the first column. And uh, they've had quite an increase in the last few years of the data recording. Um, fairly steady increase up until the last um, five years, and then they had a big jump in their wages. Um, actually, for all these people uh, on the left axis, you can see that the wages run from about from zero up to um, pretty close to $70 an hour. So it's, they're not really high wages, but they're quite respectable wages um, in the latter years, uh, for example, for particularly. Um, so a lot of these individuals have had a pretty nice steady increase. Um, there's a few uh, that have had um, slightly different experiences. Um, a few that have had um, one year with a much higher income, like 2361 had a good year around 2000, um, and then back to more their usual pattern, usual scale, um, and a few that sometimes have had some lean years as well. Um, there's a one in the middle, 3473, who had a fairly, fairly nice increase early in their workforce experience, um, and then flattened out. Alrighty, so that's the longer term people in the data set. Um, let's do the same thing for people that were only uh, recorded five times. Um, and there were uh, less people there. Let's zoom in on that one as well. All right, so something I think is quite interesting here is that um, most of these individuals with the short um, amount of times that they've been recorded, uh, they, they were recorded very early on in the study and then not recorded again. Um, so it, it's just the odd person, like the first one, uh, 206, who was recorded four times in the first few years and then not recorded again, but suddenly it's come back into the study in 2018. Um, I think that's pretty interesting in, in a sense. Um, maybe they had, I mean, it's, it's fun making uh, I, um, explanations. Um, they're just explanations, they're just guesses, but that's a sort of profile that I might expect to see from someone who maybe didn't have a great experience in the workforce for a while, but suddenly things have come good and so they're happy to be watched again. Um, we don't know, but that's the, mostly when um, there's a few observations per person, it means that they've um, maybe dropped out of the study. Um, so that's good to know because that tells us a bit about um, we maybe don't have enough information on the, those people that um, with short series because uh, they've not been recorded um, in recent years. So it tells us a bit about the support for the data and then what we couldn't say about it. Um, the next thing I do is um, then actually filter out the records for people that have a few number of observations so that I can focus on the people we've recorded for a long time. Now, that can be problematic um, because that might Im, Im introduce or will introduce some bias, um, uh, but because maybe people that stayed in the study for a longer period of time had quite different experiences than people that dropped out of the study. Um, so ju ju just being aware of that possibility, um, we may be able to come back later 
um, maybe by doing follow-up surveys for some people that have dropped out to find out more about their experiences. But at the moment, um, we don't, we just don't have enough information on the um, short series to make much, um, make many statements about them. So I would filter out um, individuals with measured only a few times. And I've picked 10, um, a bit arbitrarily, but we're going to pick um, only people that have at least 10 records and then, um, and then start um, making plots of the individuals again. So now um, I've got the records for all the individuals that have been recorded at least 10 times. And that's what's displayed in the plot at the right. Um, and I think the one thing that jumps out from this is that there's a couple of people that have really quite high um, hourly wages, uh, but most people are on around about the zero to 50. And if we want to take a look at um, those outliers, here's where it's really nice to use an interactive plot. So I'll add um, mouse over to get the IDs up. Um, that way we can see whether those high values are due to a single individual or to um, just uh, multiple individuals popping up or dropping out. I think as you mouse over, you can see just two individuals, 45, 24, and 32, 47. So there's a couple of individuals that have much higher wage experience or wages, average wages, than, than most people. All right, so let's take a look at um, that generally, I'm going to calculate the average wage per person. Um, to do that, yeah, I'm, I've called my data with 10 or more observations longer for no good reason. I probably should change that, but longer is the data set that I'm gonna work with, um, data object I'm gonna work with for the rest of the analysis. Um, to do that calculation of means, it was easier for me to convert the data back into a tibble than a Sybil. And so I'm calculating the average wages. And um, then let's take a look at those average wages per person. Um, I'm going to choose to make a box plot here because I want to focus on outliers. And um, box plots can help um, are better than histograms in order to focus on how outliers. So if you look at the box plot, you can see that yeah, the average wages, it's really only those two individuals um, that have much higher wages than everybody else. Uh, there's a few people on the order of $25 to $35 um, that make that much on average. Um, not very high wages generally, but so, so there's only the two outliers is um, a, a key. And so we might, again, filter those out because we can't say much about those two people. Um, if we're trying to understand what the general experience is, we want to focus on the majority of people, not the ones that have really unusual experiences. Just as a, as a um, comparison, let's turn this into a histogram instead. And you'll see what I mean about the outliers. So the problem with a histogram is um, you have to pick up the outliers by tiny, tiny little things on the um, x-axis. And it's easy to, when you've got a lot of data, that just sort of disappears. If I even change the plot, um, plot size, you'll see that they pretty much disappear. So if you want to focus on outliers in the data, using a box plot is a better choice than, um, than, a, than a histogram. Um, right, so the next thing is just removing those um, extreme values. And uh, then we can make the histogram to look at the shape. So um, this is a histogram with bin width five, which I thought was a good choice of bin width to think about $5 intervals. But in retrospect, if I'm only looking at people under $35 an hour, um, five is too big a bin. So it may be better to um, just drop that down. If we look at two, um, 
two is pretty good. Uh, but the, the main pattern that you see is that there is a little bit of skewness, not as much as I would have expected, actually. A little bit of skewness and a few individuals on, on the larger wages. I think my preference was actually one. Because with, with a bin width of one, you can see that there's a, there's a really small number of individuals that have um, wages. I think that's... You can count back 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Yeah, 2 and $3 per hour, 2 and 3 and $4 per hour on average. Uh, but particularly that 2 and $3 per hour, there's still some people that have experienced that on average. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's really low wages occasionally as well. Um, the next thing to do is think about other ways that we can symmetrize this relationship. And um, it, it, symmetrizing um, a distribution can also be useful for graphics, um, which we might see later, but um, particularly if you're going to fit a model to this data, you want to have um, wages in a more symmetric shape because um, when, when you're fitting a, um, a model, assuming a normal error is easier than any other type of error. So if we take a log transformation, that, um, that does really quite well in terms of uh, making, it, making it quite um, bell-shaped. Actually, just as comparison, in the end, um, Right, sorry. I think actually a square root is better later on, but it doesn't look better here. Oops, let's try again. So that's a square root transformation instead of a log. And you can see it doesn't quite remove all the skewness. Um, but it still makes it a little bit less good than the original data. Right, I'm going to pause for a moment. I haven't seen any questions in the chat. Um, does anybody want to make a comment or a statement? I'm not sure how well you're getting on with um, working through with me, if you're trying to work through with me. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, I can try and unmute you if you want to ask directly. I don't see anyone saying anything in the chat, so. All righty, so let's push on. on. Um, beauty, someone's following, it's great. So uh, now that we've, we've just taken out two extreme values, um, which is uh, just a couple of observations. Now let's look at the um, data again. Um, and So now looking at the traces um, for each individual again, um, again, looking at the raw traces, it, it's quite messy still, um, but now, now I think we can um, focus more on the general pattern of people um, in terms of their wage experience. Uh, we haven't done any transformations yet, and maybe that's now the time to try some transformations of hourly wage again. Um, so you question the chat about trying several transformations. Um, you could make multiple copies of the code and then put, the, put those plots side by side um, if you want to make a comparison between them. Um, that would be the easiest way um, that, that I would do. Yeah, and sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes I do that. Let, let's take another way of doing that. Um, so I'm going to do the square root transformation here. And so that's the way just with square root, just as a comparison. So the R Studio window is nice in the sense of going back and forward. So that's the raw scale. This is the square root scale raw scale, square root scale. 
So the square root scale um, makes it a little bit cleaner to look at that big blob of um, uh, traces, right? And then, uh, so, so I like that kind of technique in the R Studio window rather than necessarily side by side. Um, uh, so if I want to show the log, do the log transformation, let's take a look at that. And I think it's too strong for this data. You might disagree with me, but um, that's a log transformation. Um, and to me, it, it then exposes a few um, outliers on the low values. And, and maybe that's something that we could treat like the really large values and, and take out those individuals and, and stick with the log scale because we know that it makes it more of a symmetric distribution. Um, but I, 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 I decided to, so we can just go back to the other two charts, square root, raw scale, square root and log scale. So to me, the log scale is a little bit too severe. And um, I decided to just push forward with the square root scale for wages um, for the next analysis. So what's the next thing? Um, oh, I think that's just a repeat. Yeah, so, oh, no, it's not. Um, so one thing also to do now is to overlay um, some model. And I, an easy one to do for this type of data is to use a smoother. Um, that way I'm not imposing too many constraints on the type of model um, that should be fitted to the data. It's just going to average the um, wage um, across the sliding window. Um, a little bit more than that. It's a low S smoother that I've done here. Um, so that blue line is my um, model for this overall experience. And what do we see from that? So on the square root scale, um, wages are gradually increasing and then sort of tapering off. I think there's a lot more things that actually we can see um, in this data too, but just in that overall pattern, um, it is possible that at some point, uh, some of these people in the study are close to retirement age and, and maybe um, they're retired and that might drop that overall wage down. Um, may, maybe, maybe not, maybe that's the usual experience that your wages are sort of um, plateau out after a particular time in the workforce. Um, there's a few more things I think you can see just from the big hairball of lines. Um, it's quite dense early on, but it gets much thinner and thinner and thinner um, as time goes on. That's, that's just the, that's really the dropout rate. Um, all righty. So the next thing in terms of analyzing the trend or studying the trend that I like to do is fit a, fit a model for each individual. And here's where I would use a linear model because a linear model is um, less assumptions for a small number of observations. So if, I, if I've only got 20 observations, um, a linear model is probably better than anything else. So this is a bit tricky, but I'm going to set up a function here that um, will take a, a set of values that has got a year variable and a mean hourly wage variable. I'm going to reset a year to be um, from zero and use that in my model and just fit a linear model to the wage against year. And I'm going to extract the slope and the R squared from that. All right, and so now the next thing to do is to apply that to all the individuals. And this is a little bit um, tricky. I can't quite do that on a Sybil without a lot more work. Um, so I'm gonna convert it back to a Tibble then group by ID and then run the summarize function. And uh, this, is, um, this is a little bit of a trick. This cur data function is making sure that it's calculating it actually by group. Um, if I don't do that, it doesn't, doesn't do that group uh, wise calculation. Righty, and now we're going to look at um, the R squared and slope. Uh, across all those subjects. So on the x-axis, I've got the R squared. That's measuring how good the fit is 
close to one means the model is almost perfectly explaining the relationship and close to zero means the model's not explaining at all. And then the slope is basically telling us how much their wage has increased over the time. Um, so you can see a few things from that. There's one person with a really high slope with the model is kind of a reasonable model, not a great model. Um, there's a lot of people that have, the model fits really well for. Most of the people have really high R squared values. Um, and uh, the slopes are generally above zero, which means for most people, the wages are increasing. But there's a few people in this study where the slope is less than zero. That's what the white line at, at zero is, is a bit of a guideline. So a few people that have experienced a negative um, uh, wage, hourly wage as time goes on. Now, if you wanted to, um, we could just add interaction to that plot um, and mouse over and see what those um, values are, as well as find the individuals with that pattern as well. Um, but now my next step is actually using that information to extract out different people. So I'm gonna pull out the top 12 people um, in terms of increasing wages and um, plot those 12 individuals separately. Um, and so now I've got the top 12 slopes and um, the, the points, so top 12 slopes and the people that correspond to those top 12 slopes. Um, yeah, exploring, it's, it's kind of in a sense, yeah, exploring confirmatory analysis. We'll talk a little bit more about Confirmed. I'm going to run a little bit over the hour. I can't help it. I'm sorry. This state, this state is really interesting for me. But I think one thing that you see is that there are a bunch of people where um, where there's quite a difference over the time frame um, of wages going up and down. Um, so there is some volatility there um, yeah, amongst the highest slopes. Uh, let's look at um, the most the the people that have experienced a decreasing slope. Uh, de decreasing wages. And um, you see a few of the shorter series here. Um, if it's, yeah, I mean, but you also see some longer series as well. So there are some people in this database who have had a, not a great wage experience um, over their workforce. Um, life in the workforce, um, but also you, you still see the volatility in those wages, that um, wages are going up and down from one year to another, and it's almost more um, the pattern than, than the steady increase. So we can look at those as well um, by looking at the R squared. So I could take um, the top 12 most varied experiences by you looking at the lowest R squared. Um, actually the lowest R squared, most of those slopes are pretty flat, but you can see just how um, from one year to another, their wages have gone up and down. Uh, we can also do the same thing, pick out the people who've had a really steady experience by picking out the largest R squared. Alrighty. So um, there's one person with a shorter series in here, but most of the ones with a steady increase have been in the study for the entire period of time. And those wages have really come from, you know, way down at two or three dollars um, up to about 20 odd dollars in recent years, 20 to 30 dollars in recent years. Um, that's that's quite a quite a nice sight to see. Alrighty, so I just now want to um, stop at that point. We could look at some of those statistics again, but here's a point where I would bring in the demographic variables and start to look at um, whether education makes a difference. 
Now, one thing that we've observed from the individuals is that there is a lot of variability from one individual to another. And I think that's the primary structure in the, the data rather than that overall um, gradual increase. Actually, the common experience of people is some volatility in their wages and some people have a lot of volatility in their wages um, and, and, and fewer maybe, and other people have a bit more um, regular uh, change in their wages. Um, I'm going to then ignore that a little in order to look at the education. So start by tabulating your um, demographic variables. So first thing is to look at um, how many people have we got in the different um, education categories. So we're making a bar chart. Uh, what we, well, those aren't ordered, um, but we've got uh, people from ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. But the big thing to see is that actually most of the people in this study now, even though they're high school dropouts, and now can sit, now have somehow um, got their high school equivalency. Um, so they've got uh, 12th grade education. Um, and because there's such an imbalance in those classes, uh, my tendency would be to uh, group everyone who's not 12th grade into a single category and just look at 12th grade versus less than 12th grade. So I'm gonna use the four cats package to do that. And uh, factor collapse um, is a nice function that allows you to recode um, those category levels and need to also reset the levels again um, with this um, factor command to make sure that I only get those two new factors. Um, and so then take a look at, uh, I'm going to just show the model basically for those two different groups. Yep, so here's where we've got side by side. Um, yeah, the full data uh, faceted, faceted by um, the education level. Um, now we've got all the people in those categories with a model overlaid. And now it makes it a little bit hard actually to compare that model by when you've got them split across the two different groups. You still see that big variability though, so that's important. So it, it is worthwhile to make that display of the models only on one plot. So I'm gonna use color to code the models. I'm gonna throw away the variability just so we can focus on, on the model um, alone. So just looking at the difference in education experience by a uh, difference in wage experience by education. And, and this, is, this is interesting, I think, because it does match what we, can what we would expect, what we had expected um, prior, that there's basically, on average, like a, um, what's that, about a $5 difference at the end of the wage force experience. Um, but early on, there really isn't much difference, or uh, there really is no difference, but the gap gets bigger the longer in the wage force um, for this data. Now, um, there's a question or comment in the chat because there's, it's, there's some interesting things to think about related to this. Yeah, okay. yeah thanks. So <laughs> the model plots is helpful. Good. Um, there's possibly confounding factors here, which I'm a little concerned about in terms of making any statements about the difference in that overall average based on wages. You know, if, if more people with lower education have dropped out of the study early, um, there's, there's a lot of things we can't answer um, for sure, uh, but it's something that if we wanted to really make a statement about the impact of education, we need to think about what possible confounding factors there are um, related to dropouts and, and bias. Um, but one thing that we can do is just test the strength of that relationship. And so I'm gonna finish it on this level. I'm gonna skip through the other demographics and go down to um, using some randomization to check just how strong that difference is. Um, relative to the overall wages. <clears throat> so this is a bit um, 
bit tricky, but I'm going to take out the demographic variables. There's a lot of code here. Um, just the just ID and the education level. And now I'm going to scramble up the education. So someone who had was labeled as 12th grade, they might get labeled as, as 9th to 11th. I'm just going to scramble that label um, in, in a new data that, I'll, that I'm thinking the P is for permuted data. So I'm going to scramble that one. And now we're going to take a look at, um, and now I'm going to join that back to the original data and make a plot of, of permuted data. So now, now the thing is, I have removed any association between wage and education level. Um, time is intact. It's just, it's just removed any association between wage and education. And now I'm redoing the model plot. All right, so um, th that's what we'd get with, without um, without any real association between education and gender, they look almost identical. Now let's do that a few times. Just run that, um, these lines a few times. And uh, take a look at the plots that emerge because you need just one sample is not enough. You see sometimes that there is a bit of a gap but I don't think it ever gets quite as strong as the original data. Like there's a bit of a gap there. And actually it says that 12th grade education is um, not as beneficial as less education with that one. So um, the randomization can help get some sense of that strength of the structure. And if we want to do that in a more persistent way, I can um, put them all in a single plot. This again is a little bit complicated code, but it's basically gonna make um, 11 uh, permuted plots and pop the data in a random place in, in that set of 12 plots. And um, then, then you might take something like this to someone else, um, uh, your colleague down the hall or your partner or or teenager and say, hey, can you pick, pick the pl plot that's the most different from the others out of this? Um, and I think what we could see, I think we can all see which is the data plot, right? Um, number six was the what we saw before, um, but it allows us to compare that, that gap with what we might observe by chance. And so you can see that in some of the other plots where we know there's no association between hourly wage and education, there is some difference in those um, models, particularly towards the end um, of that time frame, And that's where there's a lot more uncertainty in terms of um, the measurements and, and um, in, in, yeah, in terms of the differences between education, there's less certainty about those differences towards the end, but, but still the the conclusion we'd make from that is that the gap we have in the real data is bigger than anything that we would observe by chance. Alrighty, um, that's that's as much as I want to talk about today. Um, I hope some of this has been useful. Um, there's only one more thing I'd suggest if you're really curious is to try um, this bit more sophisticated um, plot, uh, uh, linking between plots at the bottom, but um, I'll... Uh, Leave, leave it for now, but I'm quite happy to take some questions and comments and, um, and ideas um, for a few minutes. Yeah. Thanks so much, Di. We know you're on the run to other meetings, but yes, if we have any questions, will the code yes, be shared? So, so the code was in the link. Yes. And Stella, I can share that with you. Yeah, thanks, Joyce. The T in Sybil. Oh, yeah. I have a standing joke with Eero. I think she likes this, that um, Sybil is pronounced, is how is, is Tibble in Chinese. 
<laughs> yes, I don't know. I don't know anything <laughs> about it, but that's the way I think about it. Is the T is the T is sort of there, but it, it's still, but it's a little bit silent, but it's still there. It, it, yeah, it's a civil. I don't know, but it's mostly civil. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, thanks again, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm really thrilled to be speaking so far away. Um, Yes, we really appreciate you um, speaking and sharing all this information with us. It was really, really, really great. So thank you so much for joining us.